managed to catch Shelley's um, part one last week. It was amazing. It was really good. A really good introduction to this chapter. So I'm really glad that I listened to it. And we are in that portion where we're looking at Paul showing us how to behave like Christians. And if you've been following uh, this, the Bible study with Andrew Ollerton, you'll know that we're on that descent down the mountainside where we, the descent of devotion as we return to normal practical life. You know, we've been on the mountaintop experience, but we're practically returning to our communities. And how do we live as a Christian? And um, Shelley talked to us a lot about um, our identity and as we continue to be transformed. And she talked a bit about living sacrifice and transformation. I really like verse 1 in chapter 12 and the message version really resonates with me where it says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. You know, it's all about all that we do every day, walking around. And that was a really good start for us last week as we got into that, wasn't it? I'm not sure if I'm echoing because I'm a bit close to that or not. <clears throat> so here we are. We're about to look at Paul giving us some practical tips on how to live our lives. And when we start reading it, it sort of all seems uh, reasonably simple. Ha <laughs> ha. Not sure about that. So I'll just see if I can move the clicker on. Never know. Oh, ooh. oh, that looks a little bit small, um, but hopefully you can see some of it. We're gonna, we are going to read that um, portion of chapter in a moment. But part two talks about us being loving servants. And there's, um, I've got two little sections to this. One is about loving servants and um, loving one another, sharing with each other. And then about loving and sharing with those we don't know, strangers, enemies. Not necessarily enemies, people we don't know, but could be strangers or enemies. There's two sections to this. And we are told that we need to practice um, hospitality and share our experiences. We're told we need to, to be together, <coughs> weep, laugh together, share our resources. And if you look back to where Paul was when he's talking to the Romans at the church in, in Rome, at that time, they were more of an underground church, and they would have met together and shared all that they had. They pooled their resources. So we've sung this morning about, you know, our silver and our gold. Uh, I won't withhold any of it. And we're singing about it. And I guess this is where we start to look at, do we mean that? And um, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded about that often where the early church was quite simple about this. They looked after each other. And it's important that we, we bear that in mind. And uh, if we just go on to seeing um, the relationship with each other, one of the things that I think is really important is to remember that this is a theme throughout the whole of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. When we look back at Psalm 133, it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like oil poured on Aaron's head, as in healing, anointing, blessing. And, and I think it's a concept that we see that Paul then takes and follows it right through. So we can see some of those words there, aren't they? Having spiritual fervor, uh, hating evil, clinging to good, being sincere, being sincere in love, sharing our experiences, sharing our resources. They're all the things that he wants to tell us about. So um, when we look at our relationship to each other, this is Romans chapter 12, um, looking at um, from verse 9. So love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour mm. one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when Dorothy was talking about hope there, didn't we all feel joyful? We were with her on it, weren't we? Let's carry on being with her with this, joyful in hope and fervent about it. We are to be patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And we've talked about prayer again this morning. 
and share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. And I think this is really important for us to get a bit of a grasp on. When we talk about hospitality, I think it's part of, when we talk about love, we can, we can be a bit airy-fairy about it, but when we talk about hospitality and all these other attributes, they're about love in action, aren't they? They're about practicing it out. It's a practical way of showing it. <clears throat> I will say, when I talk about hospitality, I think in this church there's a lot of um, hospitable acts going on. When I think about hospitality, I always say, I don't think I'm very good at it. And it's because in my head, I'm thinking about inviting someone around for a meal, and I've got to tidy my house, I've got to prepare some food, I've got to do a meal, and I start to get a bit stressy about it all. So I always think, I'm not very good about hospitality. But then I realise that I probably practice it in other ways. And I'm always I'm quite willing to have, if you, if you drop in at my house when I'm in, I'm quite happy for you to do that. I, if I've got some food on the stove, I'd be quite happy to share that with you. And, you know, so I do, I believe we should have open doors to each other because all that we have, God has given us. I tend to think my car, it's not just mine because God's blessed it with, God has blessed me with a car. So I share it and, and I'll often, um, I, I'm happy to offer people's lifts because it's not just mine. My garden, it's not just mine, it's if I've got a slightly bigger garden. When we moved from our previous house, we had a little concrete yard. And when we got the privilege of moving into our current house that had a slightly bigger garden, it's not that pretty all the time, but I remember thinking, oh, this is space to bring the youth group that we were looking after at the time. That God's given us this space we can have, you know, time around. And I know uh, Rob and Eileen have often given their house and garden over to the young people over the years. They've had a settee probably in the past that got really worn out. Their carpets got worn out because the amount of hospitality they were giving to the young people. And that's what we want to see, isn't it? There, I was chuckling to myself, there's something in Timothy about um, hospitality and the sign of um, a good woman, although it's a bit out of context, it's a widow, but a good woman who um, does good deeds and washes the Lord's, uh, washes the feet of the Lord's people. Whoa, whew. I can tell you, I've actually done that. <laughs> and I'm actually quite good at it. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Don't all line up afterwards, though. <laughs> you know, there's many ways we can show hospitality, isn't there? I was looking at um, something Wayne Grudem, the theologian, says. He describes the church in two ways. He describes the church as the invisible church and the visible church. And the invisible church is the church that God sees. He sees us all. He sees you. And you are his beautiful bride. And we talk about the church in those sort of terms. But then there's the visible church, which God's expecting us to show quite clearly to others around us what we look like. And it's what others see. And so often we know that that can, in the news, can always look, sometimes look a bit negative. But what are others seeing when they look at you, the church? What is it they see? <clears throat> I once had a bookmark that said, it had a picture of a judge on it and said, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? What is it that you're doing in your life that shows that you're a Christian? And there's a question that always uh, it's stayed with me, challenges me all the time. Gruden also discusses the marks of church as in adhering to correct Bible teaching. We perhaps have the sacraments, sort of baptism and the Lord's Supper. But visibly, the church is encouraged to share the gospel in word and deed. So there might be in evangelistic ministries or mercy mission ministries. And James chapter 2 tells us and says to us, what good is faith without deeds? So we do need to be doing something active, something obvious. 1 Peter chapter 4 says, be alert and sober-minded. Pray, love each other deeply, and offer hospitality without grumbling. And use your gifts to serve others. I think Shelley mentioned a bit about that last week. Use what you've got to serve others. 
whether it be um, sharing some resources in terms of finance or food, or whether it be your time, whether it be these groups, and we can see these groups are setting up, you know, praying on a Monday morning, getting together at Rob and Eileen's for, um, you know, some sessions. These are all hospitality. And if you're considering a ministry of helping others, this is hospitality. I don't know if any of you received um, a letter from um, Care for the Family this week where Rob Parsons talks about how him and his wife, Diane, um, had a very difficult period of time in their life and started to just, others were coming to talk to them and they, they had a little life group. And they began to realize it's because others needed to talk about their experience too. And they, want, they needed to be listened to. And it might be that that's what you're offering might be that through what's happened with you, you are thinking of, well, I understand how that person's feeling. I can walk with them on that journey. And it may be that's your new hospitality uh, ministry. We then go on to look at <clears throat> blessing those who um, persecute you. I might have to go on to the next one. Um, yes, there we go. The relationship to each other. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I'm reading this slowly because I don't probably need to preach if you get these words. <laughs> rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do you know, there's so much in these verses, and I couldn't possibly pull them all apart and preach on each other, because you could. You could preach on just a couple of words there, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but I think this is what this says to us. You know, if you are insulted because of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory, the spirit of, uh, and the glory of God rests on you. I think that's what it's saying. So... We don't feel very blessed, do we, if we're insulted or accused? I've had that happen to me this week. I've had a really bad email sent to me this week. And it hurt me. And um, I felt insulted and I felt cross. And I just thought, Whoa. You know when you want to start going... And I thought, mm, no. How am I supposed to be responding to this? I will say, I've not dealt with it immediately because I needed time to sleep on it. <laughs> and I think that's wise, you know, because we're not all naturally perfect. <laughs> I needed to sleep on it, and I've, I've still been sleeping. I've slept on it for now three days. Uh, I'm not <laughs> I will respond, but as, I, as, as, the, as I've sat and pondered this um, sermon, I feel like God's telling me something. In my natural, I want to be quite firm and assertive and, and cross and uh, direct and all those words. But I realize that maybe there's something here where I need to be gentle. And I perhaps need to consider this a blessing because it may be an opportunity for me to perhaps turn something around here. So pray for me this week. <laughs> Might need help with that. How do we respond to that person? <clears throat> we're called to serve rather than to retaliate you know we're talking about that ongoing transformation when we are transformed then all of our relationships will be too and when we talk about others watching you what is it they're seeing I remember years ago I remember uh, meeting and, and working with this hospital porter who was very quiet never said a word to anybody not a word and I would always say hello good morning can I help you can I do this let me help you with that and uh, be helpful like I would be hopefully to everybody and month in month out year in year out and I remember speaking to my brother once who had also he worked down the corridor in the theatres and he'd met this person and he did the same Hello, good morning. <laughs> Years later, this gentleman said to me, I've met your brother. He looks like you and he sounds like you. And he said, 
And so it's quite a lot of words coming from him, actually. <laughs> I was astounded, I will say. And he said, you're Christians, aren't you? And he went on to tell me a bit about his mother who'd prayed for him for years. And he'd, he suddenly had put two and two together. He realized that this woman, this end of the corridor, was related to this man at this end of the corridor. Uh, we came from the same family and possibly the same philosophy and values. And he, then he worked out, they're the same as my mother. <laughs> How amazing is God that he answered that mother's prayers for her son? How amazing is it that he used me and my brother in that moment? I'm sure we weren't the only people that crossed his path. But I think about that over and over again. And um, he's not said much more to me since, but I sometimes see him in the distance. And if I see him, he waves to me. And he's usually smiling, and he's usually, uh, when he's got his patients, he's usually talking to them a little bit. And I believe he changed, he transformed his life. I think he came back to God, and his mother's prayers were answered. There's a story of hope, isn't there? So watching what you do might transform somebody else's life, and we'll come back to that in a minute. When we are insulted or cursed, we're not to repay evil with evil. And it says a bit further on that, um, I can see that might be on a different slide. Yes, there we go. It says about, we're not to try and find the punishment or the revenge. That's not our job, it's, it's God's job. So where you might naturally feel, I want to you know, tell that person what for, it might not be our job at that moment, and maybe we need to meet that, that animosity with a kind word, a compassionate word. You know, it says in that, that it says in um, there, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it's mine to revenge. I will repay. It's God's business. You know, in terms of that, if we go on to the next slide, it says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I've always been intrigued by this verse about heaping burning coals on someone's head. Because I've always thought, oh, that sounds a bit contradictory. And I feel like doing that, you know. But actual fact, I've realized it doesn't mean that at all. It's actually, um, one commentary said, it's, a little bit, it's about an ancient Egyptian practice where if somebody was showing a sign of penitence, they would walk with burning coals on their head, which sounds very painful. Not to be recommended, I'm sure. But what this is saying is, by being kind, by, by responding, rather than retaliating, you will be as it will be as if you're putting burning coals on someone's head, and through your actions, that might change their opinion on their own life, and through your transformation, they too may be transformed. And that's quite a concept, isn't it? I like it. You know, it talks about in Hebrews chapter 13, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers because you might unwittingly entertain angels. You don't know. <laughs> so I think the stranger, it's important that we're kind to all, not just those that know us and keeping tabs on our behavior, but those that don't know us. Um, I remember once, one year, on New Year's Eve, when we had somebody we didn't know come and uh, who'd moved into his house, and it was absolute, it was, it was a right state, it was trashed, and he didn't know what to do, and he got to sort something out, and then um, he'd got no food, no nothing, no heating, so we invited him in. And again, he looked at us, and he said, you're all Christians, aren't you? And it's because of our behavior. We hadn't tried to preach to him or anything, and you could see he started to think about the way, and he, he had actually had um, in the past, he, he used to go to church and he started to talk about his, his relapsed faith. And he began to realize there might be something there. So God is sort of saying, 
by being transformed yourself and showing kindness and hospitality, this in turn will show others that there might be a different way. I'm really taken with this behaviour thing because um, a recent quite close family member of ours recently decided to make a decision to follow Christ and has been baptised because he watched the behaviour of Christians when they were heckled, when somebody was verbally abusing them, how a group of Christians behaved began to change his way of thinking. And um, we've prayed this week about one of our life group members, their son-in-law is getting baptised today down the road. After many years of prayer, this uh, gentleman has decided to make a, a step and a public declaration of his faith. And I'm sure it's taken a while, but part of that decision will be because of the influence of family and friends around him. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Our behavior matters. I don't know if you've ever had that somebody say to you, call yourself a Christian. Have you ever had that? (laughs) I remember learning a bit about this as a child when... um, I lived on a a council estate, and um, our neighbour used to play uh, records at top full blast, Elvis Presley and Tammy Winnett. And my mother had had enough of, you know, stand by your man and all the rest of it, and fools rushing in. And and she used to play her music, her, you know, hymns and godly music and Linda Hutchins and all the rest of it uh, at top blast. (laughs) The battle of the music. But then one day there was a bit of a falling out and um, the woman next door screeched at my mum, call yourself a Christian. <laughs> and I remember as a 10-year-old going, oh, 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 how dare you say that to my mum, she's much better than you. you know, This sort of behaviour. My mum immediately reprimanded me and said, enough, go inside. Quite rightly, she was right, wasn't she? <laughs> Because that's not how my parents were going to respond to this. They were going to respond with a mild, meek word. They were going to turn the other cheek. They were going to say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Okay. Let's, you know, and and they did. And I don't really know what words were exchanged after that because I was out of it. And I was feeling quite cross. And what do you mean? I'm defending you, Mum. But no. She was saying, no, as Christians, we are called to turn the other cheek. We are called to respond in, in, in an appropriate way. Romans 5 verse 8 said that Christ died for us while we were still his enemies. He loved us. Therefore, we should imitate Christ and we should love our enemies too. How we respond, how we imitate Christ, how we have Christ-like behavior sets us apart as Christians and we're to live peaceably. <clears throat> it's very difficult at the moment because there's so much going on, isn't there? And we see in the news the impact of, of hate protests. We see what's going on, don't we, in the Middle East and we wonder. Oh, in fact, as Christians, we sometimes don't know how to pray, but we're concerned for both sides, aren't we? As Christians, you know, our, our response is to pray for the situation because we don't know how we're going to solve it. And we have to imitate Christ in these. But it causes us concern when we look, doesn't it? And I think we should be really aware of what's going on. We don't have all the answers sometimes, but I know God does. But we have to pray. If you're troubled by what you see on the news, my best advice is to pray. And there's some terrible things happen, and we see where enemies um, or things happen, and people have to dig deep to seek forgiveness for others. I don't know if any of you watched the recent um, update on the Lockerbie disasters where families have been revisited to see how the impact of Lockerbie years ago has affected them. And there's one family that talked about forgiveness, and I actually have um, a personal relationship with somebody whose daughter died in that Um, event and him and his wife said we forgive we forgive and you wonder how you can say that don't you I recently (coughs) had the privilege of going to see the play um, the hiding place um, about 
uh, Corrie ten Boom and her family, who were Dutch watchmakers during World War II, and they, they were actually um, Christians, and they did a lot about giving help to the poor and needy, and of course, that meant, at that point, there were Jews fleeing for their lives, and they had a secret room in their house that was called the hiding place, and they rescued many, many Jews. Um, but later on, her and her family got sent to a concentration camp. And Corrie ten Boom talks about, during that time, her sister was not well, and one of the prison officers was particularly cruel to her, uh, and her sister did die in a concentration camp, but years later, she, she met the prison officer, and she said, I forgive you. And that um, officer came to Christ, actually. <coughs> but Corrie ten Boom herself went on to become a great minister and teacher and preacher. And um, I have this quote from her, actually, which, which she said, when he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. And I like that because in my natural, I struggle sometimes to love some people. <laughs> there are some people that I find difficult and my situation, and I, I hope you will pray with me this week as I respond to this situation. I'm struggling, but I need God to give me the love. I know he will. I believe he already has, actually. Well, he has. I can do this because God gives me the love to share out. That's our strap line, isn't it? You know, graciously giving the, sharing the love of God. I think Andrew Ollerton shares a, an example in his book about forgiveness. His auntie Edna, who was a very wonderful lady who prayed for many people, she was very elderly, and her house got burgled. And uh, she was a bit shaken up. And when they asked her, her family asked how she felt, she said, well, I guess my prayer list has just got longer. I need to pray for those two young men who have attacked me in my home. And they were caught and sent to prison. And years later, um, Andrew Ollerton tells a story of how he met up with a prison chaplain who said one of those young men did come to Christ and his life was transformed. And it's because Auntie Edna has prayed over the years. So when we talk about have we got stories of hope and transformation, I know they're all over this building. So Dorothy, hopefully they're going to come flying to you, these examples. <laughs> People have got examples of hope. Uh, we ourselves have got our own examples of hope, haven't we? And it's important that we share that because we do need to be joyful in hope. I love that. I wasn't particularly going to focus in on that, but I feel that like God tells us that. There's a quote, I can't remember where I got it from, it says, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So we need God to help us do that, I believe. And it finishes off with overcome evil with good. And this is what we're called to do, isn't it? Overcome evil with good. And let's see what happens when we do. Let's see the difference that your transformation has on somebody else. Will they too be transformed? I want you to think about that. I want you to think about this summary is there anything that God is prompting you about today? So we've seen we need to have a sincere love for one another, look out for each other, share our experiences. We need to practice hospitality and humility and integrity. I think they're my three favorite words, actually. I'm going to work with those. Live peaceably, do not re seek revenge, but overcome evil with good. Um, I've, I've just got a last um, thing I want to read to you from John Wesley where it says, he said, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. That sums it up, doesn't it? Let's think about that. Let's practice our hospitality and be sincere. So um, I'm going to invite the team to come up and, and, and sing with us. But you might want to spend a bit of time reflecting. 
Is God prompting you on anything? Um, you might be like me, need a bit of help to, to treat somebody right, to respond kindly and compassionately. So you might need a bit of help. So um, I think I might be standing there first with some prayer. But you might just want to say, God, help me to show how, how to give. And um, we've, we've talked about that this morning, haven't we? So bless you. Thank you.